man. God is our captain, and he is the anchor of our hope. Vicki <laughs> can see me, so she can make fun of me or whatever she feels led to do. But I feel like I'm on The View. <laughs> What'd you say? I meant the general scenario of uh, sitting around chatting with you guys. In regards to today's message, I'm waiting for it. So right now I'm going to ask that you guys would, would extend your hand in my direction. And we are going to pray that God would give me the message that all of you need to hear. That his Holy Spirit would rain down on me and all of you as we enter in to his presence. And I'm giving him thanks in advance for what he's about to do. Amen. Amen. And, and getting ready for <coughs> today, you know, it's like a year-long process. And when we left, and then we got together in April, we decided on anchor of hope. God be in our anchor. Sarah, my daughter-in-law, was searching the online garage sale pages and found that. And sent it to Joan and she says, get it! <laughs> ten bucks. Yep, ten bucks. <clears throat> oh, yeah, you want to haul it up the mountain, right? <laughs> so, that's, that's been in my garage for a long time. And I was asked to, to fill in for our pastor a couple times, and I got a message together, Anchor of Hope. Hey, I'm going to be prepared way in advance. I won't have to cram, you know, the week before. And then I was asked to, uh, to fill in for Pastor Blystone in, in the Leaper churches. So I did shipwrecked. Shipwrecked and not abandoned. So if everything goes as planned, you probably have about two hours worth of <laughs> message here today. I brought it along just in case as a backup. But I felt God telling me that I'm not going to need it. That I'm not going to have to rely on or have a safety net to fall back on. So there went that idea. So during praise and worship last night, I got the impression I had my eyes closed. And I, I know God speaks to us each differently. Some it's in visions. Some it's in billboards. I would like my answers to my prayers be posted on a billboard as I'm going down the highway and would say, it is yes. <laughs> How about when you come out of the shower? It would say, no, on the mirror. <laughs> Sometimes God talks to me when I shut up long enough to listen that things will come to my head and I just start writing it down. I don't have time to think about it. I just write really fast and really bad. And then I have to come back and try to figure out what it is I wrote. It's awesome, but few and far between that those times happen. But when it does, I know that it's God speaking because I can't think and write that fast all at the same time. That didn't happen this time. It happened for another message that I'm working on for March or April. So I'm like, okay, God, you know what? I know you're faithful. I know you'll provide. Why are you waiting so long? I go out here to the table this morning. And then some church people show up. They, they, they just landed out there. Oh, I suppose you wanted to be alone. I want to take our picture. My selfie stick. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not worried, I'm not anxious, and I know, I know God is 
is working the right thing. A couple things that did come to mind. was that his people are drowning. That they don't know how to swim or stay afloat. And oftentimes I think we feel like that in our own everyday struggles. That if one more thing happens, I'm, I'm done, I'm going under. I, I can't handle one more incident, one more problem, any more drama. He, he said that I'm to show, show them the way. Show you the way to Christ. Show you the way to swim. Show you the way to handle your problems. I don't know. I just know that he's faithful. Not just to teach you to swim, but to rise up out of the water. He can lift us out of the deepest depths of the ocean that we would find ourselves in. Like Peter walked on the water, showed so shall they. Walking on water was just not for Peter. Some of us may be the rest of the disciples that were still in the boat, not yet having the courage to step out not yet having the faith to move on. But I give Peter a lot of credit. He got out of the boat. He stepped out. Some people down Peter, but you looked away. Well, sometimes we, we do turn away. Sometimes we're so caught up in the hurt and the emotion of our situation that it is all consuming. We need to know that, that Jesus is there for each and every one of us. And that's just not a, an empty cliche. I have been through hard times. I have been through good times. 1996, my husband walked into my office where I was working. My husband doesn't come to my workplace. It's in another town from where we live, so it's a specific drive. He walked in to tell me that my sister was just killed in a car accident. Talk about drowning. She didn't, but I did. I wasn't mad at God, even though I had a few choice words for him. <clears throat> but we made it through it. We don't understand the details. We don't know the whys. We just know that she's in a, in a place with Jesus. Did I flounder at sea? Sure I did. But I always hung on to the fact that God loves me more than I did my sister. July 24, 2017, we got a call. <clears throat> My brother suffered a ruptured aneurysm. They were taking him to the, John, where's your tissues? I got one. They were taking him to the nearest hospital to, to Harrisburg. Hershey didn't have a bed for him. His aorta had ruptured. Fluid was filling his abdomen, and they weren't acting quick enough at the hospital. His son said, "Come on, people, this is here's my here's the wallet. You figure out what card you want. Let's get a move on." They flew him to Philadelphia because Hershey didn't have a bed, which was probably a good thing. Philadelphia, I believe, is a teaching hospital, and they had a team of people that worked on him. He was down there through October 1st. He was on kidney dialysis. 
his kidneys weren't going to make it. He ended up on a heart and lung machine. Blood clots kept kicking the machine off. He had a fo football sized blood clot in his abdomen. They tried going up this way to get to the, the blockage. They went down this way. 9.30 at night, I get a call. They're going to do one last procedure. He's been in surgery for eight hours today with several different procedures. This is the last option we have. If this doesn't work, he's not coming out. Talk about drowning. My mother was picked up by her brother from Oil City, taken to Harrisburg, and over to Philadelphia where she could be with her son and his wife and his family. Talk about a hard week. But I kept telling mom, he's coming out of there. It's not looking good. I hope he does. That's wishful thinking. But something deep inside me said, he's going to be all right. My mind is saying, no, he's not. He's got one foot over and the other foot not barely hanging on. But there was a piece inside of me that said, he's going to be all right. Yeah, but what shape is he going to be in? It doesn't matter. Regardless of his condition, I still wanted my brother to be here. He is now in the Mechanicsburg Health South Rehab. He's been there since the first part of October. It's closer to his family in Harrisburg. He took his first step a couple weeks ago, stood for 30 seconds. He walked 33 feet the other day with the help of his nurses. He went from only having water since July to applesauce and pudding a couple weeks ago. He passed his swallowing test last week and had mashed potatoes and gravy. Now he's on regular food. I told him, you will walk out of here. The same God that raised Jesus from the dead is living in me and you will walk out of here. Well, maybe it won't be on this side. No. I am believing and holding on to that faith and that hope that he will come out of there. He still has some serious health conditions going on. There has been numerous, thousands of people praying for him, supporting his family, people that they didn't even know cared as much, have supported them. Her friend started a GoFundMe page. The church has been dropping off um, or the her, my daughter, sister, sister-in-law's work was dropping off food on Mondays. The church had a fundraiser. It's 60 bucks going back and forth every day from Harrisburg to Philly. But it's in times like this that you have to dig deep. You can't wait until you're in that crisis situation to draw out those, those healing scriptures. Don't wait until you're in the ER to know that, you know, I am healed in Jesus' name. Together he works all things for good. You, you, you just can't wait till that crisis. You have to spend time reading your Bible. Well, it doesn't make sense to me. So what? Take one little verse and read it. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Post it on your fridge. I took a, a circle, peel and stick, dry eraser sheet that the college kids, it was in the college department at Walmart, took the circle, peeled it, stuck it to my bathroom wall. I got praises on the top, prayers are on the top, thanks are on the bottom. It reminds me to be thankful. It reminds me that God was with me then, it reminds me that God's going to be with me later. If the Bible is overwhelming for you at this point, 
take one little verse at a time. To be honest, there are books in the Bible, I don't know if they're in the front or the back. I have cheater tabs on my Bible because I got the Matthew, Mark, okay, they're in the back. Some are, are spiritually mature. Some are, are, are baby beginners. Find somebody that you can look up to. Find somebody that can kind of mentor you. Invite somebody to Bible study. Invite somebody to your church. If you're not comfortable witnessing to those around you, bring them to a place where somebody else can witness to them. My friend and I have this, this running joke that you invite them, she'll speak to them. <laughs> Everybody has their, their gift dates. Everybody has their, their niche. Jeanette can sing. I can invite her to sing. <laughs> I cannot sing. Robin can attest to that. When I went to Helen Furness and, what was that other church? Scotch Hill. Scotch Hill. The pastor says, oh, by the way, your accompaniment is not there on Sunday. I said, what does that mean to me? <laughs> he says, you have no music. <laughs> Oh, okay. I thought it was just at one church. I think they share the, the piano player. So I thought, okay. I'll download some YouTube hymns. Okay. I got some nice one. Trust and obey. You know, familiar ones that everybody should know for the 10 people that were there. It was a small congregation. I go in there and they say, oh, so and so's not here for the music. And I'm like, okay. I have my little speaker and I have my, my phone and Sarah's been teaching me how to like do things on it and get the music ready. And okay, trying to do, no Wi-Fi available. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't laughing. <laughs> kicked out of the junior choir. <laughs> and now you want me to lead worship. No. Talk about stepping out of your comfort zone. But God was faithful. I think I lip sung. I let everybody else sing louder than I. <laughs> it all worked out. I did not worry about it. You just, you just roll with it. And sometimes that's all you can do. Ride the wave to the next one. You know, sometimes you think you're on a surfboard out there. You're just going from one, one crisis to another to another. Eventually, you're going to make it to shore. Matthew 28. No, Matthew 11, 28 to 29. says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you. Not just Joan and Debbie and Linda. All of you. He will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Do you know what a yoke is? Going, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> it's a wooden device that they use to attach two animals together to help multiply their energy in carrying out the, the work task. Somebody's coming along beside you to lift you up, to partner with you, to help you through your situation. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. <clears throat> Who needs rest for their souls? Only two people? <laughs> oh. <laughs> there are times where we need rest. There's times when we need help. And God will provide those people for you. Ask for it. Say, God, you know what? I'm, 
I am floundering here. I need some help. Let one of your prayers be surround me with a circle of Christian friends. You are who you hang out with. Where are you hanging out at? Who are you hanging out with? You know, some people that work in factories or bars or, you know, they've got a lingo all their own. And I'm not allowed to repeat it. <coughs> you are where you hang out. Let your Christian walk be a light to them. Don't take on their bad characteristics of the world. Let, let your life, your walk, reflect onto them. <clears throat> Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. I looked up brokenhearted, but I left it in the printer. <laughs> I'm driving here and went, oh! She was like, what's the matter? I printed that out and sent home in the printer. <coughs> She's like, it's all right. We can, we can look it up again. <laughs> but from what I remember, brokenhearted could be distraught, hurting, broken. Abused. I'm a mess. Sometimes I am a mess. Sometimes people in leadership think that they have to have it all together. <coughs> Let me give you a little secret. Yeah. They don't. They hide it better. They hide it differently. <laughs> yes. Don't be ashamed or afraid or let your pride stand in your way of other Christian counseling, other Christian friends to lean on. If you don't have a close couple of friends that you can confide in, ask God to send you one. He will. Maybe he'll send you two. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. There are times I have been crushed. There, there are times when, when I might get a call from one of my kids while they're in college. Mom, this is going on. Mom, I'm sick. Can you bring me some of your chicken soup? <laughs> you know, they're three hours away. <laughs> if you wait two days, I can FedEx it to you. <laughs> the Halloween candy got there in one day. <laughs> Sometimes distance between people, you, you can't be there as much as you want to. But with prayer and with God, we're in the same time zone. There are no disconnects with God. He doesn't drop your call. Amen. He doesn't put you on hold. He might say, wait a minute, Cindy. Wait a minute. I want you to step back and I want you to look at it from my perspective. You know, in an argument, there are two sides to look at it from. Yours, okay, three sides. Yours, the other person's, and the right one. Sometimes we look at a situation and think, that's not fair. She did this and, and he said that and, well, when you look at it from their side, it's because maybe you did something. It takes, it takes two to have a disagreement. 
And I like the philosophy that when you are working on unforgiveness and you're trying to forgive somebody and you know what? And, and both sides are thinking that I'm right. Well, I'm right too. You know what? I'm sorry for the part that I played in this situation. Can we move forward? Sometimes that's all it takes is an acknowledgement of the other person's hurt feelings. Sometimes you may never get that other person's forgiveness or their acknowledgement that they hurt you. Maybe they've passed away and you can't, can't tell them that you're sorry. Tell God you're sorry. Leave it. While you're here, and you get some time away. Tell God the things that are bothering you. Sometimes verbalizing, it, it helps, it just helps. <laughs> I, I do better if I read it out loud. If I just read the scripture or something in, in my head, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to register. But when you speak it out loud, it, it go, like goes through your ears and then down into your heart. It, it just sinks in. And sometimes, you know what? You have to have your own little pity party. But don't decorate the pit while you're in there. <laughs> you know what? It's okay to have your little mommy meltdown or whatever you want to call it. When you're flat faced down on the floor, sogging up the carpet. God help me is about all you can get out. That's all that's needed. He hears the cries of your heart when it is so broken that you can't even put words into it <coughs> or to it. Has anybody been there? Is there anybody still there? Well, we're going to leave all that here this weekend. You could have 300 people praying for you laying hands on you. But if your heart is not ready, right. if your heart is not willing, well, I've dealt with that years ago. Then why are you telling the next 10 people you come to? Well, she did this. He did this to me way back then. Um, it's like that, what's that little cassette called? The eight track cassette? You know, play that track over and over and over again. Some of you are seasoned enough to remember the eight track cassettes. <laughs> Some of you are too young to remember them. <laughs> They're the big chunky things you put in the tape decks. But, you know, Satan has a way of just spinning that around and around and around. And you think, well, I've let go of that. then why does it still hurt when Satan brings it back up again? He likes to throw guilt at us. Yep. He likes to distract you. He likes to de derail you. How many feel like you've been targeted this week? <laughs> there are awesome things happening here this weekend. I got goosebumps just thinking about it. <laughs> you don't need flamboyant prayers. You don't have to be wordy. <clears throat> God, help me to forgive. I think we've all been through times in our life that rather than forgive somebody, you would just assume they got run over by a truck. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a big truck. <laughs> okay, slightly grazed them. <laughs> you know, sometimes those thoughts get ahead of themselves. We're human. Sometimes you would just like to gib slap people. Just want to. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we're, 
we're supposed to be loving and kind. And we try. We try and sometimes we fail. We're human. Sarah, could you pull up my song? Well, she's working on that. There's a little story I'd like to, to read to you. And it's, it's in the book called The Buzzards Are Circling, But God's Not Finished With Me Yet. <laughs> I don't know where I found it. It says, Jesus gave us a wonderful invitation. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That's the one that I read earlier, but so very true. Jean Griffin, a member of the member of my church recently told me a story of a young woman, Brenda, who was invited to go rock climbing. Although she was scared to death, she went with her group to ascend a tremendous granite cliff. She put on the gear, took hold of the rope, and started up the face of the cliff. After a while, she maneuvered to a ledge where she could take a breather. But as she was hanging there, the safety rope suddenly snapped and against Brenda's eye, knocking out her contact lens. Standing precariously on the ledge, hundreds of feet above the ground, she began to look frantically for the lost lens. Hoping it had landed near her feet, she stooped down to search, patting the surface. It wasn't there. On that frail ledge between the summit and the ground, her sight now blurry, she grew more agitated and fearful. In desperation, she began to pray, asking the Lord to help her find her lens. After reaching the summit, the group descended to, down the mountain using a walking trail instead of repelling down ding, the same cliff. <laughs> Brenda and the rest of her group soon met a party of climbers who were just beginning their ascent up the same cliff. One of them shouted out, Hey, you guys! Anybody lose a contact lens? <laughs> Brenda rushed toward the climber, elated. How did you find it? She asked, excitedly. The climber told of seeing a tiny ant moving along, slowly along the large stone where he was sitting. As he looked closer, he noticed the ant was carrying something. <laughs> you guessed it, a contact lens. <laughs> you don't have to carry this thing. If God can recruit an ant to carry a contact lens, he can take care of the details in your life. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. In the Jonah Syndrome, Eugene Peterson says, pity is one of the noblest emotions available to human beings. Self-pity is possibly the most ignoble. Pity is the capacity to enter into the pain of another in order to do something about it. Self-pity is an incapacity a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. Pity discovers the need in others for love and healing and then fashions speech and action that brings strength. Self-pity reduces the universe to a personal wound that is displayed as proof of significance. Pity is adrenaline for acts of mercy. Self-pity is a narcotic that leaves its addicts wasted and derelict. There is nothing as pitiful as a pity party. This pastor says, I know because I've 
I've been asked to supply refreshments for several. <laughs> As a pastor, I have been asked on many occasions to attend pity parties. Usually, I haven't received formal invitations. Many of them were not that well planned, and some were even quite spontaneous. The atmosphere of a pity party has never been that attractive to me. Grim face masks, floor level countenance, wet eyes, it's not a party you would want to bring a guest to. And what intrigues me most is that there is no music. What's a party without music? Nobody sings at a pity party. There's no accordion, there's no dancing, especially if you're a Nazarene preacher like me. <laughs> And the saddest of all, pity parties sap all the energy from those who throw them. There is nothing left. Some of that energy could, be, could have been used to help another who had suffered a world-crumbling situation. Just something for us to think about that a lot of time and energy is... is gobbled up in our emotion. When you are hurting, when you are angry, when you are holding on to unforgiveness, it can be so all-consuming that that is all you focus on. One way to counteract that is praise and worship music. I believe that when you're playing your praise and worship music, it keeps Satan at bay. I like to think that when you're playing your, your, your Christian worship, whether it's the, the more heavier, rocky kind or, you know, hymns, whatever speaks to you spiritually, whatever puts you in that frame of mind that you can enter into God's presence so that you can leave those things with him. I like to think that praise and worship is like screeching in Satan's ears. You want to change the atmosphere in your house? Turn some on. You want to change the atmosphere in your workplace? Turn some on. Play it on the way to work. You can have your own revival sitting in your car on the way to work. The other day I was on my back porch. I had my radio on. I had my shofar horn. I think the neighbors thought I was calling in the L. <laughs> I'm waiting for the deer to start coming in the backyard again. I'm out there. You know what? I'm out there for as for me and my household, we shall worship the Lord. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Satan, you have no place in my house right now. As for me and my, my family, we will go on to worship you. My children are mighty men and women of God. And I have my own revival right there in the front porch, or back porch. Gives me goosebumps right now just thinking about it. When you speak it out, it builds up your faith. <clears throat> speak it out. Speak those promises of God back to him. Not necessarily are you reminding him, but it does you good to, to know them. God is our anchor of hope. He will get you through your situation. It may not be the way you want. It may not be the way you had planned. But he does know what your future holds. God has a better plan. No amount of worry is going to change the outcome. So speak it forth as if it were so. In my brother's situation, it has helped me to focus in. I've done a lot more praying in the last couple months, let me tell you. Because that's all I can do. He's five hours away. It's not like I can just, you know, click my heels and be there. And to be there to watch him be sedated, he doesn't even know I'm there. But 
if, if you look at our, our world, then we have this layer of the supernatural layer. And then you have the heavens. If we could see into that spiritual realm, you would see that the angels are worrying for you. They are fighting the battles for you. We need to activate them. God, send your angels to help me. When you get up in the morning, spend time with God. You think, oh, I've got 15 things on my list to do today. But you know what? Write them down. Mm -hmm. Write them down. God will show you which ones you need to do. If they're in your prayer time, you're like, oh, i got to throw the laundry in. Oh, i got to feed the cat. Oh, I've got to run the dishwasher. How many times are you in the middle of your quiet prayer time and you're like, oh, i got to do... What I'd like to do is <coughs> plead the blood of Jesus over my, over my mind right now. Anything that comes to mind, God, that you want me to remember to do later, I'll write it down. That way you're not so focused on remembering those things. And maybe God's going to impart some things on you that you hadn't thought you needed to do, but oh, good thing you remembered, reminded me. Spend time. Get to know the captain of your boat. Because the captain of my boat walks on water. And when you, when you are anchored to something, you might drift away a little bit, but you're still tethered to the source. And he is always there. I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Oh, my song. Wait, I gotta do my song. Flip on the other What the other speaker is. Just flip it on. Flip it on. I would just like you to My wife turned it down. I want you to listen to the words. Okay, you don't have to sing unless you want to, but Listen to the words. And then as we depart, we're going into our, an hour of quiet time, yes? We are going into an hour of quiet time and what time is it? 11.30. 11.30? 11.30. Oh, when we keep talking? So we're going to have quiet time to 12.30 and then lunch will be served in the dining room. So following lunch, you have a great time. You don't have seminars and stuff to go to all afternoon. You have your time. And <clears throat> during that time, you will see on your itinerary um, that there are, are different things for you to do. In the rec room, Sarah will be uh, offering a craft. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do all of them. You can do whatever you do and do not wish. You will like Harriet will be reading a painting one, and I believe we only have no. How many? How many easels? How many canvases do you have, Harriet? Uh, we have around forty-eight. Oh, okay. So it's called first come first serve. Don't stand for me. Please don't hurt people on your way in there. But uh, anyway. Uh, so she's going to give you an opportunity to do something with that. We also have a prayer time at this time that Carol will be leading. Um, if you would like prayer, um, in her room is right here in the hallway. Um, and Carol uh, will be available for prayer. And we have other team members that will also be available if somebody is with her. And so we're going to have that available if you'd like someone to talk to or someone to, to pray with you. And uh, at 3 o'clock, do we tell you about this? Do nope. they tell you about this? No, nope. it's not written down either. Uh, it's under other. I'm telling you. <laughs> Subject to change? If you would like, <coughs> I will give a, a choice to you. I think Vicki will be there. But at 3 o'clock, anyone who wants to, there is a little chapel up the hill. Has amazing acoustics. 
we go up there and we sing Acapulco style, you know. Um, <laughs> Exercise. The weather's beautiful. If you cannot, there you can drive a car or something there. Um, but anyway, ask anybody team wise or, or people who've been here before, and they'll be able to tell you how to go get up there. But anyway, so that's at, at three o'clock from uh, three thirty. Is that the time that they have on team team sheets? Thirty. There was a woman who came on Sunday morning. We asked if anybody wanted to share anything. She got up and started crying. And I thought, oh dear. It was a great weekend for her. She said, yesterday afternoon, I took a bath and nobody knocked on the door. <laughs> we found out she had five kids. And uh, so, you know, this is your time. Spend time with the Lord. Spend time with other people. Um, whatever you wish to do, read a book, take a nap. Um, but by 5.15, I need us to be here in this room. If you want to gussy up for dinner, you can do so. If you, you know, if you're like elevated, you're just going to clean jeans. All right. Um, you know. But um, anyway, but we will be here at 5.15, and we will go into dinner together. Okay? So, did I miss anything? No. Let's no. pray. Almighty God, you are an awesome God. And uh, as Candy, I, I, I imagine right now, it's just the, that's over. Um, we, we just thank you, Father, for the message. Uh, we, we had no, no qualms about it. We had no fear. We knew that you were going to show up. And Father, I love it when you show up and you show off. So uh, we praise you and we thank you for everything. Um, I pray that right now, Lord, as we go and, and we spend a quiet time um, with you, that you would minister to your women, that you would speak.